All right, it is now 2 p.m., so we will go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's webinar, the PREA audit, um, the role of corrections agencies and advocates. This is the sixth webinar in our webinar series, Unpacking PREA, the North Carolina Approach to Victim Services Behind Bars. Um, we're so happy to have you here with us today. My name is Gabriella Nyman. I'm a training and communication specialist with NC CASA and will be your moderator for today's webinar. Before we start our webinar, here's some basic information about NC CASA. We are an inclusive statewide alliance working to end sexual violence through education, advocacy, and legislation. We use a social justice framework, therefore our work is done from a strong intersectional social justice perspective. By centering our work around marginalized communities, everyone is served. Some of our work includes a training institute, supporting root crisis centers, resource sharing and technical assistance, legislative and policy work, anti-human trafficking outreach, prevention education, working with colleges and universities, and providing access to language services. Before we begin, I want to go over some webinar logistics. All participants are muted throughout. Please enter any discussion responses in the chat box at the bottom of your screen as shown in this slide. Uh, we will have time for questions at the end, but please feel free to ask them at any time. Uh, you can submit a question in the Q&A button. Um, I will be keeping an eye on them throughout. We want you to be part of the conversation, so we have included polls and questions so we can engage with you throughout this webinar. Adding your perspective and experiences throughout helps us be able to better serve you when it comes to PREA. The webinar will be recorded. A recording will be posted on NC CASA's website and also our YouTube channel in the coming days, along with the resources mentioned in this webinar. If you have trouble with Zoom, please email me at gabriella at nccasa.org. NC CASA is pleased to bring you this series of eight webinars. This webinar is the second to the last in the series. If you were unable to join us for any of the previously aired webinars, they are on our website and YouTube channel. After today's webinar, we will have one final webinar to close out the series. This final webinar will focus on development of the MOU to provide confidential support services to incarcerated survivors. As our presenters will explain, the PREA audit is the way corrections facilities receive confirmation of their compliance or non-compliance with the PREA standards. The audit process is long and complex, but our presenters will break it down and explain the roles and responsibilities of both corrections and advocates. For corrections, it may not seem readily apparent how victim advocates can support during the audit. This too will be explained. For advocates, we will discuss ways to find out an audit is scheduled. And for both, if an auditor causes concern or is doing a fantastic job, we will share information for reporting. We will also have a fantastic guest presenter joining us, someone with experience in corrections as the PREA coordinator and as a DOJ certified PREA auditor. I would like to introduce you to our presenters for the webinar, Tara Graham, she, her, hers, Senior Program Director at Just Detention International. Tara spent nearly 14 years working on the development and implementation of the PREA standards. Lisa Cook, she, her, hers, Jail Consultant for NC CASA. Leah is the former Buncombe County Jail PREA Coordinator and was a DOJ Certified PREA Auditor. In her work with NC CASA, she assists in creating trainings in partnership with NC CASA and other agencies. She is the co-author of the North Carolina Approach, creating and navigating new relationships to better serve incarcerated survivors of sexual assault, a resource that we will go over on the webinar series. I will now hand the webinar over to Tara. Great, thank you, Gabriella. Um, as always, it's been a, it's a pleasure to join you all today. I know I'm looking at the attendee list. There are some familiar names. Uh, so thank you for joining us again today. Um, first of all, I just want to thank o the Office on Violence Against Women. It's because of their generous support that we're able to bring you this webinar today in collaboration with NC CASA. Um, and for those of you that are new to joining us today, Just Attention International, or JDI, is a health and human rights organization 
that seeks to end sexual abuse in all forms of detention. Um, and we do this a variety of different ways. One, we partner with corrections officials, rape crisis advocates, and policymakers to make facilities safe. Um, we work on changing uh, the public attitude around people who are in confinement and about their right to be safe from sexual abuse. And we also support incarcerated survivors of sexual abuse and sexual harassment. And JDI, at the end of it, our core principle is a belief that no matter what crime a person may have committed, that rape is not part of the penalty. So I just wanted to mention too about self-care. Um, as those of you who have joined us previously, you know that we will talk about uh, survivors um, of sexual abuse and confinement. So I just wanna alert you to that. We don't have any videos today, uh, but in a moment I'm going to share some information about a survivor. Um, so just take care of yourself. If you need to step away, please do so. Um, like Gabriella mentioned, the, all of the webinars will be posted to NC CASA's webinars. So you can always um, catch up um, at a later time. Um, so to get things started, let's do a quick get to know you. Um, like Gabriella said, we can use both the chat box or we can do polls um, on the webinar. And so we first wanna just make sure everyone knows where the chat box is. Um, and so tell us who's joining us today. Um, tell us your name and where you work. So again, just take a moment in the chat box and tell us, introduce yourself, who you are and where you work. Great, we have Megan from Families Living uh, Violence-Free in Oxford. Rosemary from Alliance Against Intoxicated Motorists. Deanna Harrington from NC CASA. Uh, someone from the South Carolina, Carolina Coalition Against Domestic, Viol Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. Um, Taniqua from the PREA unit with the Department of Juvenile Justice in Richmond, Virginia. Wonderful to have you, Taniqua. Uh, Tierney uh, from the U.S. Army in Illinois. Wow, thank you for joining us all this way. That's great. Uh, Barbara from a resource advocate from a safe home for everyone in Ashe County. Madison also from a safe home for, or from a safe home from everyone also. Uh, Nisi from Family Crisis Council in Salisbury, North Carolina. Great, and I know we ha also have some staff from NC CASA that are joining us. Um, thank you for giving that introduction to yourselves in the chat as well. Um, oh, and Lisa, who's the PREA Compliance Manager with Virginia DJJ. Lisa, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, later on, we'll be talking with uh, Lawanda Long, who is actually the PREA Coordinator for Virginia DJJ. So it's nice to have some of her colleagues joining us as well. Great, thank you everyone. Um, oops, and so now we wanna try out the poll. So Lisa's gonna launch a poll um, and it's gonna, it's, the question is about your experience with the PREA audit. So if you've been part of a PREA audit with your facility, if you're from corrections, um, if you've been part of the PREA audit as an advocate, um, if you know about this thing called the PREA audit but you don't have any experience, or for some of this, for some of you, this may be learning about the audit for the first time. So just take a minute and you can click on your screen um, your response. All right, I'll give another 30 seconds for people to put in their answer.
All right, so it looks like, um, what's your experience with pre audit it? Uh, I have been part of a pre audit with my facility, 21%. I have been part of a pre audit as an advocate, 0%. I'm aware of the pre audit, but do not have any experience, 14%. I am learning about the audit for the first time, 64%. Wow, thank you for that, Gabriella. I mean, this is really interesting to me because I think in a lot of the other webinars, it's kind of been split across um, whatever question that we've been asking about the content of the webinar for today. But it, you know, the vast majority of you, um, this is the first time for you hearing about the audit, which excites me because, um, you know, I, Lisa and I, I will speak for Lisa. I think we're kind of uh, nerds about the pre audit and probably for Lawanda as well. Um, Lisa uh, Rio, who's also on the line, all of us have experience with the PREA audit, whether as auditors, I've helped train the auditors, um, and working in facilities, um, some of us have even had experience actually being audited. So um, please don't hesitate to ask questions throughout. Of course, we will have a Q&A session at the end as always, um, but please start adding those questions to the question and answer box. Um, and as appropriate, we'll, we'll read those and answer those along the way. So um, for those of you that have joined us in the past, um, often we will have various survivor stories to share. Um, and today I don't have a video for you, but I do have something from one of JDI's action updates. These are sort of uh, periodic newsletters that JDI puts out. Um, and this one in particular uh, features Nathan Jones, who you see on your screen, who's a survivor. Um, and I'm just going to read for you this action update because I think it, because it focuses on the importance of the audit and the auditor. So the, the title of the action update was, With strong prison audits, prisoners will finally be heard. One day in 2014, toward the end of his shift as an inmate janitor, Nathan Jones saw an item on the prison bulletin board that filled him with optimism. It was a notice explaining that his Wyoming prison would soon be audited on its efforts to keep inmates safe from sexual abuse. Any prisoner could meet with the auditor and their conversations would be kept confidential. Several of Nathan's friends at the prison were being abused and none felt comfortable speaking out. A few years earlier, Nathan himself had been sexually assaulted by a staff member while at a different facility. Nathan arranged to speak with the auditor and felt hopeful that the meeting would help put a stop to the rampant sexual assaults and harassment. Quote, I believe that this was my chance finally to have my voice heard, he recalled. But Nathan never got that chance. His meeting with the auditor was not held somewhere private, but in a room adjacent to the associate warden's office. The door to the room was left wide open and staff were within earshot of everything that was said, so Nathan kept quiet. Nathan's experience is not uncommon. JDI has learned of many instances of auditors who failed to conduct robust, robust oversight and who left prisoners in danger. In response, JDI helped pass the Parole Commission Extension Act, a law that calls on auditors to adhere to strict guidelines on how to do proper assessments, including conducting interviews in a safe space where inmates can freely discuss their experiences at and perspectives of the facility. Nathan, who was released in 2016 and recently joined JDI Survivor Council, is confident that the new law will make a difference. When I was locked up, I was denied the chance to speak openly with someone who had the ability to make my life and the lives of others better. But that's going to change, and I'm thrilled." End quote. With that, I'll hand things over to Lisa, who will, talk to, will introduce uh, information about the audit. Lisa? Thank you, Tara, and thanks everyone again for joining us this afternoon. So I want to begin talking about the PREA audit process. The audit itself is a mechanism that's really created so facilities can demonstrate their compliance with the standards. And I really encourage you to read the 400 series in the PREA standards that describes the requirements of the PREA audit and the roles and responsibilities of the auditors and the facilities that are being audited. At the end of our webinar, we're going to have several audit related resources. So make sure that you guys take a look at those. One of those is the auditor handbook that provides guidance to auditors on really what they should be doing out in the field. It's based on the intent of the standards and it goes into great detail about all of the PREA audit that we'll highlight today. So the big picture overview that we're looking at really 
is that all PREA standards apply to confinement facilities, uh, prisons, jails, juvenile detention, lockups, and community confinement, every corrections um, entity. They also are subject to the audit itself. The standard 11593 audits of standards says that the agency shall conduct audits pursuant to the 400 series that I mentioned earlier. This means that no matter if the facility is fully compliant, they're doing everything um, that they think the standards imply, if they have not uh, completed an audit successfully, then they really aren't PREA compliant. The audits run on a three-year cycle. It means that over those three years, and all of an agent's facility, so in the case of North Carolina DPS, all the prisons and juvenile facilities, um, community corrections, drug treatment facilities, they all have to be audited within that three-year span. And each type of facility, there must be one third of that type, so a third of those juvenile facilities, a third of adult prisons, a third of the treatment facilities have to be audited that first year, then the second third, then the third final piece of that audit. So in this case, we're going to talk about jails, where most counties only have one jail per county. So they don't operate multiple facilities. So that means they only get audited every three years, once every three years. So the reality, not all facilities are, uh, that are subject to the standards are, are being audited. Um, we really don't have, uh, the vast majority of our jails in North Carolina haven't been audited. So what do we do then? Well. The fact of the matter, there's only one tangible penalty for states at the state level um, whose facilities fall under the governor's operational control, meaning that the state-run facilities, those prisons and everything I mentioned earlier, um, the governor every year must submit a letter to the DOJ that their facilities are compliant or not compliant but working on it or not compliant at all and not working on it. If the governor submit that they uh, have audits and are reporting that, then those compliant states aren't going to face a penalty. But the states that are working on it have to use 5% of specific federal criminal justice funds earmarked for PREA implementation. And those states that say they aren't in compliance and don't plan on uh, getting it will lose that 5% altogether. So as of January 2020, 19 states said they were compliant, 32 gave assurances, said that they were working on it, and five said they uh, weren't compliant and they weren't working on it at all. So on a side note, by December 2022, the ability to say that they're not compliant but working on it, that opportunity ends. And North Carolina is an assurance state. So as we saw on the pr previous slide, um, there are three phases, three basic phases. You have the pre-on-site before an auditor actually comes to the facility, the on-site, and then the post-on-site. And we're going to talk about these more as we continue on through the webinar. So before we do, uh, we want to talk a little bit about the auditor and their roles and responsibilities. Their job is really just to evaluate the facility's compliance with the PREA standards. Now, in order to become an auditor, you have to meet basic qualifications and then undergo a rigorous 40-hour uh, training as well as a certification exam. You have to have a background check and participate in a field training audit, a mock audit um, that's really to practice those auditing skills. And then once certified, they're considered probationary until they've completed two audits as the lead auditor. And this certification will last for three years. To recertify though, they have to take another exam as well as doing continuing education to meet those requirements. Um, you can read more about that on the National PREA Resource Center's website. And that will give you a lot of information there, really everything you need to know. Um, my intent is really just to stress that there's a lot of time and effort that goes into becoming an auditor. 
Now, auditors have a lot of different tools at their disposal. All of this is available on that what on the PRC's website, the Pre-Resource Center. And there are various guides and templates too that auditors use um, and guide them through each of these phases of the audit. All right, so the first phase is that pre-on-site phase. In their work with the facilities, so in this case, let's talk about the jails, an auditor might request that jail, um, they have to complete this pre-audit questionnaire. And it is huge. And it asks for all of the information that's relevant to a facility's pre-compliance and their efforts in documenting this along the way to support these responses. These things could be policies, procedures, training materials. Those are all examples of things that are collected and reviewed during that pre-on-site phase. The goal is really just to reduce the amount of on-site documentation review because really the on-site is not intended for that document review. So what does it mean for victim advocates? Well, the standards that deal with the victim support and the auditor's role is the same for all standards. Evaluating whether the facility, so the jail in this case, meets the requirements of the standards. Specifically in the subsection of the standard on the frequency and scope of audits, it's standard 115.401. Frequency and scope of audits states that auditors shall have, shall attempt to communicate with community-based or victim advocates who may have insight into relevant conditions in the facility. So auditors are really trained to reach out on their own and aren't reliant on the audited facility, so that jail, to reach out on your behalf. It's encouraged auditors to reach out and initiate this contact prior to the on-site phase of the audit to just, you know, give you guys a phone call. Unfortunately, JDI and NCCASA hears from many advocates in the field that they're not being contacted about that local facility's audit and really learning only after the fact. And I do wanna mention here, which I'll mention multiple times, that NC CASA uh, has an audit watch and they really encourage all of the North Carolina facilities, all the, um, I'm sorry, not the facilities, but the rape crisis centers to report to them if they find out that there was an audit and they weren't contacted or if they did have an audit at their local facility and they were contacted. Um, and we'll mention that a little later on as well. But if you are an advocacy organization and you're concerned about not con being contacted, please be proactive. Reach out to that local jail. Ask when they're being audited. Um, go ahead and get the contact information of that auditor. And then you really uh, want to go ahead and look at um, if, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I lost my place, excuse me. Uh, so you really want to go ahead after you've gotten that information, being proactive about getting that auditor's information and seeing if, um, if you can offer any supports. I mean, uh, by the end of this webinar, we're, we're gonna give you some supports that can uh, help the facility and their staff and prisoners during this audit. Um, so six weeks before the actual on-site portion, that's um, when the facilities are gonna have to post a notice throughout their facility um, about the audit and how inmates, residents, prisoners, and staff can confidentially contact that auditor. If you're going into the facility, I know that right now because of COVID, we aren't having on-site uh, visits, but be observant when you are. That's another way to find out about an audit. And if you're contacted by that auditor, collect their contact information and share it with any incarcerated survivors. That way they can reach out to the auditor if they'd like. Okay, so what can you expect to be asked when that auditor calls you up? Like 
I mentioned earlier, they really should be asking you about those relevant conditions at the facility, as well as about the specific victim services standards that are listed on this slide. Auditors can use the supplemental questionnaire on community advocate engagement developed by JDI in collaboration with the PRC and funded by the a grant from the Office of Victims of Crime. And a link is going to be provided at the end of this webinar and we'll refer to it again when we go over the MOU webinar. But this questionnaire is really a tool for the auditor to collect additional information on victim services and to help support that audit, the audit compliance findings. So auditors can use this guide with their discussions with the advocacy organizations, but it's really just a framework to document the details and the kinds of services that you guys are offering that auditors can use in their reports to support all of their compliance findings. Hopefully the auditors are going to share this questionnaire with you guys in advance so you can be prepared um, with necessary information to your conversation with them. But whether or not they choose to share that with you, you should uh, go ahead and provide information about any of those conditions in the facility and any other relevant information that you, you know of. Um, so for example, if you have an advocate um, that's aware that the facility has a specific problem with staff sexual misconduct, or whether or not um, you have incarcerated survivors that have made formal reports, Sharing that type of information without compromising the confidentiality of a survivor can help auditors be on alert throughout their assessment and really make meaningful recommendations to increase the safety of that facility as part of the corrective action plan. Advocates should also be aware uh, and share about the services that they provide to those incarcerated survivors. If any concerns um, about access to providing those, uh, those services to incarcerated survivors exist, that should also be shared. And then you really should share information about any other local organizations that are offering uh, services that you might know or that might know of any of the relevant conditions at the facility. So, The next part is going to be that on-site phase. So that's when the auditor visits the facility. It can include three main things. Obviously, they want to include a facility tour. They do want to do on-site document review, especially if there wasn't an ability for that agency to provide the documents in advance. And very importantly, they want to have interviews. And we'll talk about each of these. So the facility tour isn't what you might get um, if you've gone through a tour. It's not the typical tour. It's really a detailed look at every little nook and cranny in the facility. They want to see if doors that should be locked are locked. They want to go into control rooms and view live video and see what's being seen on a daily basis. It includes going to every housing unit, even if they're all the same and laid out the same. And it takes a lot of time, especially for larger facilities. It could take the entire day or even days. Now, the second portion is document review. And you've got to remember, there's a lot of review of information well before coming on site. However, there is some documentation that the facility may not want to release or can't release. Um, such as investigation, investigative files or personnel files that have to be reviewed on site. The auditor is also empowered to select documentation to review, even if the samples have already been provided. So think about it, let's say personnel files to review staff training records. Um, even if a facility provides a sample, the auditor needs to select their own sample to make sure it's representative and not cherry picked just to make the facility look good. Now, the last part of the on-site phase, 
that's going to be the interviews. And I strongly encourage you to review the auditor handbook to see the breakdown of the number of interviews and the types of interviews that the auditors have to conduct. Uh, these interviews are going to be very time consuming part of the on site portion of the audit. And also keep in mind that during that facility tour, the auditor is consistently talking to all those around them as well. So who is interviewed? Well, first of all, there are going to be specific staff based on their roles and responsibilities, such as a warden or an agency head, uh, the PREA compliance officer, classification staff, and many more. A complete list, again, can be found in that auditor handbook or on the PRC website. So this might also be when they reach out to interview someone from the victim advocacy organization if they didn't do it in the pre-on-site phase. They're also going to be conducting random interviews. Now this is both staff and inmates or prisoners. Auditors are going to request a list of staff on all shifts for the days they are on site as well as of inmates or residents there. Then they randomly select people to interview. The auditor handbook again provides guidance on the number of random staff and inmate interviews as well as specific populations of inmates like those who have reported sexual abuse at that facility or those that are limited English proficiency and transgender individuals as well. So let's pause and take a minute and think about why would an auditor want to interview someone who might not speak English proficiently or who's severely mentally ill. So I want you guys to take a moment in your chat box and comment about the importance of speaking with these individuals. Um, like I said, limited English proficiency, maybe someone who has severe mental illness, transgender individuals, someone who, who has reported sexual abuse in that facility, and just uh, type that into our chat box. All right, don't be shy, guys. I don't want to give you all the answers. All right, to gain honest feedback of fair and equal treatment despite the differences in language or abilities. Yeah, very good. Um, or lack thereof, yeah, that's right. And also to check to see if they have a system in place to communicate with that individual. Um, especially if it's someone who's limited English proficiency, maybe it's someone who's deaf and needs an interpreter. Um, yeah, it's important to speak with these individuals to make sure that they are being properly educated in a manner that they understand. Very good, yeah. And that they are receiving material in a way that they can understand. Yes, that is very important, very important. If inmates really don't understand PREA and the information that they're given, how to report, you know, being the primary information there, they're really not going to be able to. All right, and we know that in the outside of prison population, marginalized populations are also vulnerable to sexual assault and not receiving support that they need following an assault. It makes sense that the incarcerated population might have similar disparities and to make sure that they are receiving support applicable to them and their needs. Very good. Yes, that is definitely all those are really great answers. And it's true. And we've talked about those special populations in our previous webinars. And, you know, the auditor needs to, to make sure that they're receiving the services that the standards intend to be provided. So thank you guys for sharing that. Um, auditors receive training on conducting interviews and they do have interview protocols that give them a sample of the kinds of questions they should ask to inform the determinations of compliance. But it's important to know that auditors for the most part are quite often from corrections and most do not have background providing services to trauma survivors. So while the auditor's questions focus on the PREA standards, 
interviews can be difficult for survivors and for staff. So auditors are focusing on the processes the facility has in place to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse and sexual harassment. But just the fact that these reasons for the questions are sexual abuse and, and sexual harassment can really be triggering for someone, staff and prisoners. So no matter when they may have experienced sexual abuse in their past, they really could use support. So unless a prisoner who has previously reported sexual abuse in the facility, auditors, auditors won't know if the person has a history of sexual abuse. And we all know that it may not be that person's history, but it could be someone close to them as well. So auditors are expected to make sure that there's someone the prisoners can talk to for emotional support following that interview. And this may be facility mental health, but it's really a perfect opportunity for a community victim advocate to support survivors and even staff there. While it's not required, auditors are encouraged to have support services available for staff as well. So as victims advocates, you can really proactively offer to be available to any staff or inmates that may need to talk with someone following that interview. Not only will it support these people, but it's also gonna lessen the burden on the facility's mental health staff that for jails locally is really already overburdened. So now let's talk about the final phase of the audit period, it's the post audit phase. So the pre-audit intended is intended to be exhaustive. Uh, facilities have to demonstrate compliance with all the standards, which means all provisions. And like we said, even if one provision is not met, the facility will be found not in compliance. So as the audit was being developed, the DOJ really listened uh, to others and specialists and, and experts um, and prisons and jails and other facilities during um, which it discussed kind of the audit not to be a gotcha experience. They didn't want to just, hey, we want everybody to fail. Um, they really want it to give them opportunities so that the facility can be a sexually safe environment. Um, and they didn't want it to just check off boxes like many other audits that facilities have. So following that on-site portion of the audit, that auditor is going to have to synthesize all of this data they've collected to make their determination of compliance. And that's provision by provision. So every standard has, for the most part, has multiple provisions. Sometimes auditors have additional questions and they have to be able to reach out to various people for these answers. And it might include victims advocates if there's a question about support services. So facilities that meet all provisions will be found in compliance and a final report will be issued. The audit is over and the facility has three years until their next audit. When we're talking about uh, jails specifically, these North Carolina jails, they'll have three more years. So facilities that are found to be deficient though on one or more provisions, they're gonna receive an interim audit report instead of a final report. And with an interim report, this also starts a 180 day corrective action period to correct those deficiencies before a final report can be issued. The auditor and the facility must work collaboratively to determine what corrective action really looks like and how the auditor is going to reassess that facility to make that final determination of compliance. The corrective action period is lengthy to allow not only for changes to be made, but for them to be incorporated into a facility's operations. It is not an opportunity just for a facility to change some policy or procedure and then check that box that they are now in compliance. So following the corrective action period, which can be less than 180 days if the auditor deems a facility has met compliance before then, and then a final report is issued. That final report must include any corrective action that was taken, and all reports must be posted to the agency website for the public to review. So Great, thank you, Lisa, for that. 
for going over all of that. Um, right, thanks, I wanted Sarah. to see, should we pause to see if anyone has any questions? It's, it's, you know, I think about it and you and I know the, the audit process inwards and outwards, but since we have so many folks that are new to the audit, I wanted to see if anyone has any initial questions. You can either put it in the Q and A or you could just put it into the chat box and we'll see it. Okay, well, if, it, if a question does come up, I haven't seen anything, uh, you know, don't hesitate to go ahead and put it in the Q&A or in the chat box and we'll, we'll see that and address it either in the moment or at the end of the session. Um, so we wanted just to show you quickly, like, you know, like Lisa said, the auditor is going to be collecting all this information. Um, and we wanted to show you, like, what is the audit report look like? So we're not showing you the whole report. Um, again, you can access this on the Pre National Prayer Resource Center website and we'll give you a link to the audit page at the end of this. Um, but the important thing here is that uh, it is a very lengthy audit report. Um, sometimes there's uh, criticism from people because it can be like 100 pages long. Um, but I think you can understand from seeing the next couple of slides why it is so lengthy. Um, so something that I've also heard over the years, um, the audit started in 2013. Um, and, you know, auditors were provided a template for their report, um, but what we found over time, what was found over time is that auditors were um, not providing as much detail about how they were reaching their decisions. So over time, the audit hasn't changed, just the guidance to auditors for writing the reports has been adjusted. Um, and so what I mean by that is what you'll see on the next couple of slides here is that I've just pulled out one standard. So. Um, it lists the standard and then the auditor has to go through and answer all of the questions. And you can see this is on your screen right now is just for provision A. So I'll read one of these. I won't read them all. Does the facility provide inmates with access to outside victim advocates for emotional support services related to sexual abuse by giving inmates mailing addresses and telephone numbers, including toll free hotline numbers were available of local, state or national victim advocacy or rape, rape crisis organizations. So that's a lot, right? But that is one part of this standard. All of these questions they have to answer come directly from the requirements of the standards. So the auditor has to check yes or no. Um, and so again, this happens for all of the provisions. Um, let's go to, the, we'll go to the next slide here and you'll see that again, this standard has three provisions, A, B, and C. So there are similar kinds of questions for all of those, right? So already you can see how this is a very lengthy um, uh, report. And then based on that, you know, if there's been any no's checked, um, well, let me say this, the auditor has to then make a determination of compliance. So they have to say that the facility uh, exceeds the standard, meets the standard, or does not meet the standard. And so if, if everything is checked yes, that they have all the things that are required, then the facility meets the standard. Um, if there's something that indicates that the um, facility has gone above and beyond, and we'll talk about some examples of what that might look like, um, the auditor can indicate that they have exceeded the standard. But if there's any uh, no that is mentioned, then they do not meet the standard. And that's where that corrective action is gonna come into play. So not only do they have to like, check those boxes yes, no, and make a determination of compliance. They then have to provide a narrative for every standard um, about all the evidence that they use. So all of the documentation, all of the interviews, what they observed on their facility tour, um, synthesizing that or the language they use with the auditors is triangulating that. So bringing all those pieces together and saying, based on what you know, how did you reach your determination? And so documenting all of that. So you can, I think you can see why it becomes such a lengthy audit report. Um, but before I move on, I wanted to just read a short passage from a real audit report. Um, and so I want you to think for a minute as an auditor. So again, this standard, and it's about the part, portion I'm going to read is actually from the standard of 115.53. So again, this is making sure that, that um, inmates have access to confidential support services, um, again, in as confidential a manner as possible. So I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs from this auditor report. 
Um, I've removed any identifying information, but I want you to be thinking about um, if there are any red flags. Now, I want to say at the start that this auditor said this facility meets the standard. Okay, so they've, they've checked that everything is in compliance, but keep your ear out and see if there's anything that stands out to you that would make you question that response. Um, and then put those things in the chat box, please. Okay, so here we go. The agency has a memorandum um, of understanding with uh, XX Advocacy Center and with the XSX Police Department. The MOU provides access to a forensic examiner or sexual assault nurse examiner when necessary. The MOU also provides access to counseling and advocacy services for the victim if requested. Both agencies have agreed to provide services for incidents of sexual abuse. During the facility tour of the living units, PREA information was not displayed in a manner that was beneficial to the inmates. The small size of the posters, the random placement of the posters, and the lack of immediate PREA education, and the lack of advocate and support services phone numbers, hotline numbers, or addresses of these facilities were not in areas that are accessible to the inmates. Fifteen prisoners were interviewed and nine were unaware of the advocacy services the meaning of the posters and their right to call or write to the advocacy center. Prisoners were not aware of how, to re how the reporting process worked and what information would be reported or who the information would be reported to. So again, take a moment and just jot in the chat box if there was anything that you heard that makes you think that actually they did not meet the standard. Like, like Lisa said, don't be shy. If there's things that you heard that make you think this does not meet the standard, go ahead and put those in the chat box. Okay, well, well, hearing nothing, if you still have ideas, please go ahead and put, them, put that in there. Um, first of all, good things that are in this audit report. There is an memorandum, memorandum of understanding, which you know we'll talk about the MOU next week. Um, a, f a sane uh, nurse is available um, if necessary. Um, and there's also advocacy and counseling services for the victim if that's requested. So that's all great. Um, and the, both agencies have agreed to provide services. So that's fantastic. The concerning parts of this report are that um, PREA information wasn't displayed in a way that people could easily see it. Um, there wasn't a lot of information about PREA generally, and the information about how to contact an advocate um, were not in areas that prisoners could see them. So that's definitely concerning, right? Like they're not gonna be able to ask for services if they don't know how to do it. Um, and then there were a total of 15 people that, prisoners that were interviewed and nine, so more than half of them didn't even know that there were advocacy services. Again, probably because those posters weren't hung in a place where anyone could see them. Um, and they didn't understand that they had a right to those services, that they had a right to confidential support services. Um, and they also didn't understand like what would happen if they made a report um, of sexual abuse. They didn't understand um, or in talking with an advocate, if they told them they'd been sexually abused, what would happen if the information was confidential or not? Um, so there were a lot of concerning things there. And so we'll talk in a little bit about, um, about if, you, if you ever are in a, um, come to find out that there's something that maybe an auditor made, found a facility to be in compliance when they really shouldn't have been, or if there were other issues with the audit itself. Um, but before we do that, let's, um, well, I guess we're going to do it now. Sorry, I thought it was after our interview, but we'll get to the interview in just a moment. So again, you know, like Lisa mentioned at the beginning, the intent of the audit 
um, is to determine whether or not a facility is in compliance with the CREA standards, but maybe more importantly, if they're to reveal if there are any dangerous practices in the facilities and to compel, compel corrections officials uh, to make any necessary um, improvements. Um, you know, unfortunately, when, like Lisa said, the, the audit was not intended, there, there was a thinking that people, especially at the beginning of CREA, um, implementation that they wouldn't be passing their audits and so they didn't want it to be a gotcha pass fail that's why they have their corrective action period but unfortunately what we found instead is that the vast majority of facilities have passed their audits with zero corrective action needed and what I've heard from corrections folks in the field you know even though there is a corrective action period that is still seen as a negative um, they don't perceive that as an opportunity to, to fix things, they see that as a fail. Um, so in fact, things are getting fixed maybe very quickly um, and things that may take longer to be implemented are you know, just kind of passed. Um, and then again, based on just on what we at JDI, you know, we get a lot of letters from survivors um, and even, you know, you may see in the news about inappropriate behavior at different corrections facilities. Um, it's really hard to believe the validity of those audit findings that so many facilities were found 100% compliant with zero corrective action that needed to happen. Um, I think I'm seeing a little bit of a change in that, that more people are um, being able to um, adjust that you know that there are more facilities that are undergoing corrective action but not not like it used to, you know there's still a large number that are passing right away um, and additionally you know many auditors were giving passing marks to facilities that were not working with outside victim advocates um, most auditors simply took officials at their word that prisoners were getting services from qualified sexual abuse counselors um, and there are certainly good auditors so please don't get me wrong um, and there's definitely been a concerted effort to improve the quality of the audits um, with additional training to those auditors. Um, but if an auditor does something that concerns you, it's really important that you let the Department of Justice know. Um, this can include reporting auditors who do not contact you as advocates to inquire about services um, that, may be provide, that you may be providing to incarcerated survivors. DOJ wants this feedback, good and bad, about the auditors. So as you can see on your screen, there's a couple of different things that you can do. Um, the first is the auditor feedback form. Um, and again, this is a place where if you have an auditor who does an amazing job, let them know too. If there's, a, if there's an audit that is concerning, please report that as well. Um, again, that's a, it's a form that you fill out on the National Career Resource Center's website, and that information is then funneled back to the Department of Justice. Um, within the Department of Justice, there is the PREA Management Office or the PMO. Um, just know that there's only four people that do this and they have a tremendous amount of work. Um, so you probably won't get, you may not get a response from them or a very speedy response if you do. They are reading your emails, it's just they have to kind of figure out where that falls in the, you know, in all the other things that they're doing. So you can certainly email them at preacompliance at usdoj.gov. Again, just because they don't respond to you um, or respond to you quickly doesn't mean that they're not reading your email or doing something about it. Um, and lastly, and this is for facilities at the state level, so this is not your local jails, unfortunately. Um, when what the D, what Department of Justice has done is that they have created a pre audit tracker, and what this does is it then when uh, governors submit those letters of we're working on it, we're not working on it. Um, or you know we're still or we're totally in compliance um, they have to submit the audit reports and so those get posted and are publicly available um, so please know that that's another source that you can go to um, i also just want to call your attention to what courtney dunkerton from nc casa posted in the chat um, that local rape crisis centers can review audits posted on the um, north carolina department of public safety website or the jail's website to check for accuracy um, so, for example, if a jail is reporting that there is an MOU with the local rape crisis center when there's actually no MOU. Thank you for that, Courtney. Um, that's right. So when the audit reports are complete, they have to be publicly available. Um, rarely now is there a jail that doesn't have a website or, you know, whether it be at the, the city or the county level um, or the state level for the prisons. And so those need to be posted and made publicly available. So that's right. So even if you can't 
If you don't find out about the audit and aren't contacted by the auditor, you can learn about the audit afterwards and review the report for accuracy. Um, okay, so now I want to introduce you to uh, LaWanda Long, she, her, hers. She's the PREA coordinator for the Virginia Department of Ju Juvenile Justice. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and I have known um, LaWanda for a long time and um, she was certainly the first person that came to mind when I thought about who could come and talk about the PREA audit kind of from both perspectives. Um, so let me introduce you to LaWanda and then we'll do a little bit of a, an interview with her. Um, so prior to joining the Department of Juvenile Justice, Lawanda served as the Eastern Region PREA and ADA Analyst with the Virginia Department of Corrections for six years. She was responsible for the development and implementation of the PREA program for the agency by providing leadership and maintaining supportive facility cultures and environments, policy modification, training and enforcing policies for prevention, detection, and reduction of prison rape. Ms. Long developed the PREA audit instrument used to demonstrate compliance resulting in 60 successful PREA audits. She has over 20 years of correctional experience serving in various administrative and supervisory roles. Ms. Long is a Department of Criminal Justice Certified General Instructor, Department of Justice Certified PREA Auditor, and American Correctional Association Auditor, and has conducted audits in both prisons and jails. Um, so Luanda, thank you again for being with us today. And like I said, you were the first person that came to mind that could talk about the benefit of victim advocacy, both from the side of working in a facility as well as being an auditor. And are you are you able to hear me, Lawanda? Hi, Tara. Can you hear me? I certainly can. Okay, great. So before okay. I start um, pestering you with questions about the audit, um, I would love for you, if you wouldn't mind, taking a moment to tell the story about your time with the Virginia Department of Corrections. Um, and the state sexual assault coalitions. So specifically, okay. could you talk about the, the relationship um, in the early days of uh, the DOC's PREA efforts and then what it looks like now? Okay, thanks Tara for having me on today. So as I go back and think of my early work with Virginia DOC, that goes back to 2012, 2013. Um, it was very challenging. When we first reached out to the advocate groups, um, they didn't have the staff to provide emotional support services to the offenders. And especially some of the prisons in Virginia DOC that were out in our real, rural areas, because um, some of our prisons were located in very rural areas. So they were able to assist us with providing emotional support over the phone only but they were unable to help or report to the hospital um, to support the inmates during the investigation process. So in, a, in partnership with the Action Alliance, we were able to use staff members, um, volunteer staff members, and they were trained by the Action Alliance as volunteer victim advocates. And when we, use, we selected these um, staff members, they were on call for on a month on call monthly, sorry, and they did not provide um, services to the offenders and DOC in the facilities that we worked on. Work they worked at. So we tried to make sure we had volunteer advocates, but we we wanted to be clear that we did not want them to provide services to the inmates or offenders that were at the specific facility. Um, we also train Action Alliance representatives on the DOC protocol, such as processing them into the facility, going through the front gate, you know, just educating them on the dress code and our security protocol. As years passed, and I want to say early in 2018, DOC was able to fully transition to the Action Alliance for all of its emotional support. Um, to include the prison and hospital. Okay. Great. So, Thank you for that. And then oh, in, oh, go and, ahead. Sorry, brother. And then in my role with, I'm just trying to capture all of the components. In my role with the prayer coordinator at DJJ, upon joining that team, they already had a partnership with 
YWCA in Richmond for emotional support and the hospital accomplishment. Um, and that has been a great partnership. Um, within DJJ, the residents can either seek emotional support um, by the phone system, where we have, con have a connection where they use it, the resident phone system. Um, they use the same phone system to report to us but as well as they hit option two on the pound five, five, and it goes directly to the Greater Richmond Hotline where they're connected to a emotional support advocate. And then they can also write. And if they write the, the YWC or the advocate, um, the director is in direct contact with me. And we see what the best way it is it was the best way for the residents to receive the services they requested, whether it be through phone, whether it be visiting the facility. So we kind of talked those processes out. Great. Thank you for that, Luanda. And I think what's important, too, is for folks in the webinar, these webinars have mainly focused on adult facilities and specifically working with jails. And Luanda, as her, with her work in a juvenile facility, as we mentioned on last week's webinar, there are definitely different considerations when involved when youth are involved um, and so that's why it does take a little bit sometimes there'll be different kinds of um, discussions and negotiations about making sure juveniles can have access to those services um the one now that you're a doj certified auditor and i say that like it happened yesterday but it's been for a long long time now that you've been certified um could you talk a little bit about how that training kind of changed your perspective on um PREA compliance and just, can you talk a little bit about what PREA compliance looks like, um, how that may have changed what you think about day to day in terms of compliance? Yeah, so it seemed like, uh, yes. So I think I was in the very second, the second class um, and became a PREA auditor. Um, when I became a PREA auditor, the purpose was just to be able to learn what the auditors will be looking for during the audit. And then so that I could kind of embed prayer compliance into our daily practices within DOC, um, which I have you know, brought over to DJJ as well. But learning the prayer compliance requirements, in addition and learning the intent of the standards was a plus for both programs. And it, it made us to be able to sustain compliance. Uh, one of my famous mentors, Chuck Kehoe, you always said when an individual is a difference between doing prayer and embracing prayer. So I think being an auditor um, and going through their training, I was able to embrace um, prayer. And then just having the understanding of the accordance of what's expected, having the conversations with staff about doing the right thing all the time and not just in preparation for an audit every three years. And you know, keep keeping prayer at the front forefront of our operation, included in our daily act that interaction with staff. And just reminding them and having those conversations that prayer prayer directly aligns with the safety and security of our daily operation. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate that. And I also look up to Chuck Kehoe, as you know. So embracing <laughs> Priya instead of just doing Priya. I'm gonna keep that one in mind. Um, well, and, and just quickly, I, I, I'm going to ask you a favor in just a moment but before we get there. Um, I was wondering if you talked just a little bit about as an auditor, when you're reaching out to victim advocates, can you give us an idea of what that looks like? Do you just cold call them? Do you, how do you prepare them for the discussion? Do you do it during the pre-audit, the on-site? Can you just talk a little bit about that? So, in, in your terms, I just cold call them. I don't prep them. I, will, I want to know <laughs> what their interactions are. So Lisa talked about the pre audit phase a little bit and how lengthy that questionnaire. That's where mm -hmm. I obtain my information about the victim advocate group. Um, their contact information, because in that questionnaire, they have to provide all of that information. So I, that's where I usually provide, get all of that information from, in addition to, you know, communicating with the facility. But I usually contact the advocate prior to my on-site portion. Um, again, I don't prepare them for anything. And I have also um, contacted them while on-site. You know, if I had some follow-up questions and 
that was brought to my attention while doing the on-site portion. Mm -hmm. And so, and then in times that I may contact them if I left the facility or, um, for example, if I had contacted them and they told me that, hey, they have not provided any services to the facility and doing the investigation process, I'm doing a reviewing investigation reports. I see that, hey, in the report, it states that advocate services were provided, the specific advocate services reported to the hospital, then that's going to be a flag to me. Then I'm going to reach back out to the advocate group to see, hey, well, did you all, I know we had a conversation prior, but are you aware of any time that your staff have provided these services, um, you know, for the jail or the, mm -hmm. the facility, and they were, were there? And if it's a discrepancy, that's a red flag for me. Got it. Thanks. All right. So now I have my favor for you. Um, do you mind doing a cold call of an advocate now? And we'll have Lisa play your advocate and um, just model. I know it won't be the full conversation that you would typically have, but could you just do a sample of, you know, the kinds of things that you might ask? Lisa, do you mind? Not at all. Okay. Absolutely. Cool. Well, if you want to, I'll, I'll hand things over to you. <laughs> All right, Lisa, let's have fun, right? All right, all right. <laughs> so first, I'll say good afternoon. Um, my name is LaWanda Long, and I'm a DOJ auditor. I am currently conducting a PREA audit, and we're just going to throw out a facility, so let's say Mecklenburg County Sheriff's Office. Do you have a few seconds that I can speak with you in regards to the facility? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay. Does your organization currently have a partnership with Mecklenburg Sheriff's Office to provide emotional support? Yes, we do. Okay. Do you have an MOU or any other type of agreement? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think we uh, signed that a couple years ago. Okay. In that MOU or agreement, what kind of services do you provide for the facility? Well, um, I know, I mean, we, we get contacts, you know, from the hospital. So, you know, we go, we go to the hospital and I mean, they, they're definitely uh, welcome to call us. I'm not sure exactly what it says, to be honest. Okay. Do you have a primary contact at the facility or um, if you had any questions so you could direct those questions to? Um, I, I think it's Sergeant Jane Doe. I'm not really sure. Uh, I mean, I, I talked to her. I, she, she gave us like a tour when we did like the visitor training, I think, but I haven't really contacted her. Okay. And you said your, your partnership began, um, about two years ago? I think that's when they signed the MOU. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So doing, you indicated a few seconds ago, doing your tour, you have been to the facility for a tour. Was that correct? Yeah. 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 It was, um, it was their, uh, their volunteer training. They let us, uh, do that. Okay. So have you, were you able to see the housing units or the areas where, um, the residents or offenders were located, so you kind of have an idea of the location in their living areas? Um, they, they showed us a, a couple spots um, in that newer side. Uh, we didn't really see the whole thing. It was, it was kind of short, and most of it, the information was really given in a classroom. Okay. Do you have any relevant information or any information that you would like to um, communicate or share with me about Mecklenburg, County, Mecklenburg Sheriff's Office um, as related to sexual abuse, sexual harassment? Do you have any, um, with receiving any calls from them, um, do you have any anything that you'd like to share? Yeah, uh, we have provided services to individuals, um, to survivors there, uh, some of which have, you know, just transferred through, um, and some of it, you know, was 
uh, for previous victimization, not not like stuff that happened in the jail. Okay. So do you get a sense of when, you know, do you do receive calls? Um, is it a safe environment? You know, I'm, I'm not really sure. There's a lot of noise in the background. And then one of the one of the inmates said something about, you know, having to pay for a call. And then some one time we got this collect call and we, we just can't accept those collect calls to our office. It's just really not what we can do. Okay. Do you have any other local, regional, or other organizations that I should contact and reference to um, the emotional support services um, that could I be offered to them? I think they told us, I mean, they have mental health um, service providers, but really we're the only rape crisis center in the area. So I'm not sure if they would have any other partnerships or, or anybody they'd be working with. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. And please feel, and I will be glad to give you my phone number if you need to contact me with if any other relevant information comes to mind. But I just want to thank you for the opportunity of sharing the information that you have today. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you both Luanda and Lisa for giving us that, that demo of, a, um, of what the conversation may be between, a, between an auditor and um, the advocate. And I think as folks probably heard, there were some things that came up um, that I, I'll put words in your mouth, Luanda, that um, were probably red flags or things that you'll want to follow up with on site. What, what, do you, what is your take on that? Absolutely, because my takeaway from that interview or, or as an auditor would be that additional training is needed um, mm -hmm. regarding the services that they provide um, and just some more interaction um, with the agency because um, it's red, there were red flags that additional conversations need to be had. Wonderful. Well, Luana, thank you again for joining us today. Um, of course, if you're able to hang out and you know join us for Q&A at the end, we'd love to have you. Um, but again, thank you as always for being part of today's webinar. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and Lisa, I'll hand things over to you. Great, thank you, Tara. Thanks, Luanda. That was that was awesome. I, I do want to share the disclaimer. Um, that I was not representing Mecklenburg's uh, Safe Alliance in Mecklenburg, um, just so you guys are clear. Uh, I was trying to make it up and kind of spice it up a little bit too. So, all right. Uh, so really throughout this webinar series, we've really discussed the PREA victim services standards. And these standards are really, they're, they're just the floor. It's that minimum that has to be achieved to really keep people safe and to keep these facilities sexually safe. So is it, it, it is common for corrections facilities to aim to meet the standards, you know, to check that box and pass the audit and not really focus on what the, the true intent is until the next audit occurs. So the result, well, compliance slips away. Um, things really, aren't made a priority. Not only does it mean more work for the facility when they start preparing again for that next audit, but it also means that the culture of the facility to keep people safe from sexual abuse and sexual harassment really hasn't occurred and people may end up getting hurt. And I do, um, I definitely want to remind you, you know, as Tara said, there have been changes to these um, auditor trainings and just how they, they document, and just because an agency passed one audit three years ago doesn't mean they're gonna pass again. So we wanna spend some time talking about meaningful compliance, and that's really that implementation of the pre victim service standards that goes above the standard requirement, that floor, and really leads to a sustainable culture change and safer facilities. So what's really meaningful impl implementation. So let's really review previously discussed um, standards here So for, for victim services. So why does PREA even address the issue of victim services? Well, the most obvious reason for providing access to survivor support that's crucial to address 
trauma of a sexual abuse and the lasting effects on survivors. But the purpose and intended benefit of this of these standards really is to extend even beyond the individual survivor. It's really to ensure support for prisoners who are experience, who experience sexual abuse and will increase the likelihood that survivors will report sexual abuse before or during or after accessing these support services and will help develop a reporting culture in that facility. So it can also lead to a safer, calmer environment for staff and other inmates where everyone knows that all reports of sexual abuse and sexual harassment are going to be taken seriously and handled in a way that's really victim-centered. So these, the benefits of uh, support services provided to survivors really can't be emphasized enough. Access to support helps these survivors process and understand the assault and deal with its impact, regardless of whether the assault occurred within the facility or prior to incarceration. And the be benefits continue to accrue even after someone is released from custody. In the preamble to the PREA standards, the Department of Justice recognized that prisoners who receive proper support services will even enhance their ability to reintegrate into the community and maintain stable employment upon their release from prison. So providing support to sexual abuse survivors also benefits the facility as a whole. The preamble to the PREA standards recognizes that as many service providers noted in their comments, Affording victims the opportunity for confidential discussions with advocates will help them feel more supported and thus more likely to report abuse and cooperate with its investigation and prosecution. So really once these inmates aren't afraid of reporting sexual abuse, the reports are gonna increase and lead to that reporting culture. So the benefits are really twofold. Well, first, facilities, these, these agencies, they can't address things that they don't know about. And increased reporting really leads to that, to increased investigations and an increased ability to hold perpetrators accountable. And then second, when a facility has a reporting culture, perpetrators will know they can't be guaranteed that protection of a victim's expected silence, you know? because that's going to decrease the overall likelihood of future, future sexual abuses in the facility. And so really decreasing sexual abuse increases overall facility safety, which will really increase the general well-being and morale of staff and inmates alike. All right, so Let's quickly review those uh, victim services standards. So when it comes to the forensic medical examinations, a facility has to provide a victim advocate to accompany victims as requested through the forensic exam process and investigatory interviews and provide emotional support, crisis intervention, information, and referrals. Now, of course, survivors don't have to say they want these services, but a facility has to make them available. So what's this gonna look like? Well, facilities should explain the kinds of services that are available when the inmate first comes to the facility. It could be during the initial or comprehensive inmate education or both. And as we've said in previous webinars, this education you know, really has to happen multiple times when we're talking about jails. Now, the information about the advocacy accompaniment should also be in that inmate handbook. It's not enough just to tell an inmate when they first come in to a jail, hey, you know, if anything happens to you, you can have an advocate there. Um, because realistically, these inmates oftentimes are not coming in um, sober. They're, they're not coming in when they're on their their best days and a lot of people are going through crisis when they are arrested. Um, so then when it comes to a crisis, they're not going to remember to ask, hey, I need that advocate. So they should be told that an advocate is available to them. And then it's the survivor's choice whether or not they want them there. So a survivor should never be forced to accept these services of an advocate. 
But it is possible that hearing about an advocate from someone from the facility where the sexual abuse occurred might not be well received. Another option is to have the advocate available at the hospital and have them talk to the survivor about the services they provide, allowing the survivor to choose whether or not to accept services. The services can extend to not just that forensic medical exam, but also the investigatory interviews and ongoing emotional support, crisis intervention, information and referrals. The advocate never forces a survivor to do anything, but provides them really with the information to allow them to make an informed decision. And we'll talk more about their role later in this training. So an auditor can talk with the facility, prisoners who've been reported abuse, victims advocates to learn about how the advocacy services have been offered to these survivors. An auditor has to verify that survivors are offered accompaniment services. They also have to review how survivors are being told about the services and how the RCC is being notified to provide these services. If facilities use staff to accompany, provide services, if an advocate cannot, then the auditor has to figure out how these people were selected and how they were trained and the reasons why the advocate was not available. So auditors also wanna learn about the ways confidential support services are provided and how inmates access those. So in order to comply with standard 115.53, agencies must provide access to outside victim services for emotional support services provided either by telephone or mail or both. So remember these services have to be made to all the inmates who have experienced sexual abuse, no matter where it happened and no matter when it happened in their lives. This includes people who are sexually abused as children or adults in the community, not just in confinement. Detention facilities have to make a good faith effort to enter into an agreement or an MOU with the advocacy organization to provide these services. In some cases, victim service organizations, they tell them they, they can't sign an agreement because corrections officials were making unreasonable demands such as insisting that advocates share survivors' confidential information with the facility staff. In other cases, an MOU was signed, but never contacted the organization again and failed to refer survivors to services or set up a way to provide access. And the auditor has to determine exactly what's happened. So services are to be provided in confidential manner as possible. This is a point where facilities and advocacy organizations really need to talk and make sure that both parties are in agreement about what confidential manner as possible means. It's critical that survivors be told the limits to, the confidential, to their confidentiality before initiation of services. So an additional component for an auditor's to evaluate is whether or not those facility enables reasonable communication between inmates and these support services. So what's that look like? Well, some examples could be inmates have phone access to services. This means they can use any phone used for any other purpose to access support services. If communication via letters occurs, it's making sure that these inmates are not limited in the length of the letters they send or receive from advocates. And as auditors, you have to really evaluate how inmates are provided access and whether or not they are are real or perceived barriers to that access, and if those inmates may not feel they can overcome them, resulting in resources really just not being used. Great, thank you, Lisa. And I recognize that we're close on time, but I just wanna spend a couple of minutes, so I hope you can hang with me, um, to talk about meaningful compliance. So when we talk about meaningful compliance, we mean that the responsibility of implementation isn't just a responsibility of one person, it's a responsibility of everyone at the facility. The, that means that the processes and procedures captured in the PREA standards are embedded in the facility operations. It's just how we do business. Um, and it's not being championed by or tied to, again, just any one, one individual at the facility, but really, um, having a facility where there's an overall culture of safety. Um, and meaningful compliance means that a facility has established a sustainable and trusted system for survivor support that is likely to be used by the prisoners. Um, it's a facility that has mean, meaningfully complied um, when the culture of the facility supports prisoners using these services. And this includes all staff and prisoners knowing what services are available and how to access them. 
Um, and it also requires a culture of acceptance um, that staff are proactively offering services to prisoners instead of just waiting for someone to ask. Um, and it would also be a facility that um, immediately replaces posters or notices that might get ripped down. Um, you know, again, in comparison, basic compliance would be a facility that has all the required services in place, um, but doesn't go above and beyond to make sure that the facility or that the services are well established. And the benefit of survivor support is completely dependent on whether or not uh, the services are actually being used. And certainly when supports are initially implemented, there may take a while for prisoners to gain trust in the system. Um, and they may be wary about whether or not they will receive reports or receive support or whether they'll be stigmatized for accessing services. Um, and we want them to, we want facilities to be looking at this process from a victim centric focus. That is how an inmate survivor would perceive the offered services. Um, and that is the basis really for determining meaningful compliance. So one of the ways uh, to ensure meaningful compliance um, is around staff, training for staff. And when staff both understand the need for the services and the benefits that the services provide, um, this can better ensure that survivors have access to the services going forward. Um, staff should be educated on the trauma of sexual abuse and how that impacts survivors um, and, and how that also may impact their behaviors. Um, this can be used, this can be helpful by doing like a scenario-based training um, that gives staff an opportunity to talk with someone, um, you know, that has disclosed sexual abuse um, and, and do so in a way that's being trauma-informed. Um, it's also an opportunity for facilities to reach out to victim advocates to see if you all can assist them with providing training. Um, you all can be an amazing resource in helping staff to understand how um, survivors can receive the help that they need. There are also other indicators that can impact the likelihood um, that inmates will access the services. Some are more obvious than others. So these are things for both uh, corrections officials and advocates to consider um, and discuss when you're figuring out how to provide services and to make sure that the people will actually use the services. So things like uh, words and language matter, right? So for example, consider signs or posters that are placed throughout the facility. Um, you know, does the wording or images make it more or less likely that someone will access services? So for example, if the poster says women's center, um, is that going to appeal to men in a men's facility? Um, is it clear that prisoners can reach out or are the posters directed more, have they been tailored at all for an incarcerated survivor or are they more, do they seem more like they're for people just in the community? Um, and do they provide, again, like do they think that it's about um, strength or vulnerability? You know, how, how is it gonna be perceived about the availability of these services? Um, so again, thinking about tailoring your ser services, especially tailoring them to the facility that you're working out, working at, um, that can be really helpful as well. Um, placement of signs matter, right? Um, we heard from that audit report that they were placed in places where people couldn't access them. Um, are they placed near the phone so people can easily um, just dial the number and they don't look, um, draw attention to the fact that we still, um, that they were, uh, that they're actually using those services? Uh, will they be able to place calls with others not really knowing? Um, that can be challenging because phones are often placed closely together in a prison. Um, how much privacy is available? Um, how much is possible? Also, what if advocates come into the facility and meet one-on-one? Um, -on -one? which I know is not possible right now, but hopefully will be again in the future. Um, how are the inmates called down to meet with that individual? Is it done calling attention um, or is it done in a way that people know that you're um, not, you know, that you're not being called down to talk with an advocate? Um, the more privacy in that respect, um, the better. Again, the name of the advocate um, will probably get out. So it's again important the facilities do not broadcast who's meeting with the prisoner. Um, and the Department of Justice has offered several suggestions for providing privacy in correctional settings. Um, and these can include um, opportunities for phone contact in more private settings or the ability of the inmate to make a request to contact uh, a victim advocate through a chaplain, a clinician, or another service provider. Facilities should also consider um, whether the options available increase the likelihood that they will access those services 
And again, remember that the services are not limited to phone. They also have to be able to reach out by mail. And if there are other options as well, but at least phone and mail are what we, we have um, to require, we have required. Um, and then we also want to think about just basic support services, um, signs and, you know, like the best, excuse me, that we want to think about even how the services are being um, accessed and whether there are any barriers to ind individuals accessing that support. So maybe they have limited access to the phones, um, especially those in restrictive housing. Remember, everyone, even if they're in segregation, should have information right now or access to that information. Um, or they should at least be able to request, do, you know, or do they have to request the phone numbers to call? Um, and then that means that someone at the facility knows that they're making the phone call. Um, how does making, how does accessing the services differ from other phone calls? You know, for example, if most phone calls um, you have to dial the full number, and for this you just have to dial two numbers, does that bring attention to the fact that someone's making a phone call? So it's just these little things people pay attention to, um, and it can definitely impact the ability to access services. Um, just quickly, some other things to think about. Um, what happens when uh, someone makes a phone call? Um, who are providing the support services? Um, and how have they been trained to interact with the inmates? So if your advocates have, do they know when it's someone calling from the jail or does it just seem like a general um, phone call? So that might be something to talk through. And then also making sure that the advocates have the right information and know about the facility so they can uh, provide appropriate services to that uh, survivor. Um, and then lastly, just quickly, I wanna go over a couple of things. You know, we work, JDI works with agencies around the nation um, and, and I strongly encourage meaningful pre implementation. Um, and we also work with victim advocates to support them in that work as well. Um, and so I just wanted to share a few things that we have heard um, from facilities around uh, the nation about different partnerships and sort of the evolutions over time like Lawanda shared. So one is that uh, the state DOC had MOUs with the advocacy organization across the state whose coverage areas included the prisons. Some of the advocacy organizations just provide phone services, while others, based on the relationships they've built with facilities, are doing even more. This includes participating in quarterly pre meetings and offering on-site individual and group counseling sessions. They are also working with inmate leaders at facilities to tell them about available services and to brainstorm how to get inmates interested in participating, especially uh, getting men to participate in groups um, in male facilities. Now with COVID-19, um, that same organization has actually been working with the agency to provide telemedicine um, services so they can still uh, continue the face-to-face, -face, even though it's over video services since in-person is not possible. Um, another example is um, our JDI's collaboration with the hotline. Again, it's to make sure that the inmates in Vermont and Michigan have access to confidential support services. Um, and that was, again, as a reminder, because of capacity limitations of the local rape crisis centers. Um, and it's not because of lack of interest, it was around a capacity issue. Um, and then just quickly, before we turn to your questions, one auditor told us about a situation where there were no support services being provided. Um, and so as this auditor spoke independently with both the facility and the advocacy organization, it was clear that it was really a result of miscommunication. So I kid you not, the auditor brought the two parties together and provided them information about what PREA required and left them in a, in a room alone for a few hours and said, work it out. Um, and this is definitely an extreme example and it's the only example like this I've ever heard, um, but they did. And it definitely shows how auditors can also be um, helpful if there are situations where the relationship between the advocacy organization and the jail are not as copacetic as the parties might like. Okay, so I know we're tight on time, um, but I just want to, we're out of time actually, so I just wanted to turn it over to Gabriella to see if we have any questions. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and give a minute if you have any questions. Um, if any questions pop up at a later time, you can feel free to email uh, me at nccasa through training at nccasa. Um, we'll also show slides coming up of Tara and Lisa's information and also um, our PREA um, 
specialists at NC CASA, Courtney Dungerton and Robin Colbert. Um, so we'll show that information. Great, and Gabriella, maybe while we're waiting for um, that, I'll go ahead and go to the next couple of slides to show uh, some resources to folks. So give me just a moment here. And again, if you have questions, please go ahead and put those up and um, we'll get back to them. Um, so just quickly, if you wanted to learn more about, if those of you that are victim advocates about your role in the PREA audit, it will reinforce the messages that, or the information that we shared today. That's a, a resource that you can access on our website. And I know J, or NC CASA will make it available as well. Um, there's also the uh, pre-audit supplementary questionnaire that we mentioned. Um, again, this is that resource we developed for auditors, but I think it's a really helpful tool for you all to know about the level of detail auditors might ask about in terms of the services being provided. And we'll refer back to this next week when we talk about the MOU. And lastly, I just wanted to provide for you that on the National PREA Resource Center's website, um, PREAResourcecenter.org, there is a tab for the audit and that is where the world of the audit will come alive. You can access all the um, PREA audit instruments, including all the report templates, the PREA audit questionnaire that we mentioned, all the interview protocols that were mentioned, um, as well as a place where you can see um, different, you can see who is certified as an auditor. So you can search by uh, state and you can see who is certified in your state as a PREA auditor. Um, so there's a lot of information that's available there. Um, and then we've shared this before, but we'll share it again and it will be on uh, NC Costa's website. Uh, but just also our contact information at JDI. So um, I know NC CASA is always available and willing and wanting to help the advocates and jails um, in your partnerships. Uh, JDI is in the same boat. So you can always reach out to us. We do have uh, funds to support technical assistance. So those are requests that you can make. Um, and I'll go to our last slide here. Again, it's contact information for uh, Robin and Courtney at NC Costa, but I just wanted to throw it back to Gabriella to see if any questions have come through. So it doesn't look like we have any questions, but definitely feel free to reach out to Robin or Courtney. Um, and uh, just to wrap it up, we will be recording, well, we did record this and it will be up on our YouTube channel and up on our PREA page. Um, and we hope that everybody has a great day and that you join us for our final webinar next week. Bye everyone.